Hello there and a very warm welcome to Meet the Disruptors. This is two days of free online events exploring key market challenges brought to you by Ditto, the B2B tech marketing practice. Um, thank you today for joining Meet the Author, the showcase with award-winning uh, author Charlie Corbett. Uh, this lunchtime, uh, we're going to be discussing Charlie's book, The Art of Plain Speaking, how to write and speak in a way that will impress the people that matter. So first to some introductions. Uh, my name is Andy Reid. I'm strategic advisor at Delega, and it's really my pleasure to be moderating today's session. And today I'm going to be joined by Charlie Corbett. Charlie is the director at the Plain Speaking Institute, more of which you'll hear of in a minute. So just very briefly on my side, uh, I've been working in the financial services industry for around 23 years. Most recently, I've spent some time as Interim Chief Revenue Officer at Blackwin. Blackwin are an artificial intelligence and machine learning based fraud detection and prevention company, where I was helping the company in their early phase go-to-market efforts. Prior to that, I've spent 20 years at Deutsche Bank, working in and across the corporate, the transaction and the digital bank, both in Europe and in the US. I'm currently advising a number of businesses on their commercial strategy, one of which, as I mentioned, is Delega, who, for those who may be interested, is a project involving a consortium of global banks and corporates who are looking at the digitization of bank signatory authorizations. But that's probably enough about me. Let's get to, more importantly, our guest of today. Charlie, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Oh, hi. Hi, Andy. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so I am, who am I? Goodness me. Uh, I'm an ex-financial journalist, an ex-hack, um, who did, I, I worked uh, all across uh, the Financial Times Group, Wall Street Journal, Euro Money, um, did that for about uh, 20 years. Well, I did, actually did journalism for about 15 years and then started a, a communications business um, where I helped, you know, my job as a financial journalist was to take complex ideas and make them easily understandable. I went into the corporate world to help companies, particularly in financial services, take uh, these complex ideas and make them easily understandable for everybody, uh, which I did um, for about five years and gradually grew quite frustrated um, in that it seemed to me that um, as, a, as a writer, as a journalist myself, we wanted to get you know the most amount of information across in the least amount of um, words. And in, in corporates, it seemed to me, in the corporate world, particularly finance, you've got the least amount of information across using the most amount of words. So I, that's, that's inspired the book, should we say. And then, uh, as you say, as you said, it won a few prizes. So I started a new business, the Plain Speaking Institute, um, which uh, goes into businesses and helps them strategically uh, get their messages clearer to a defined audience um, and in a way that's conversational and human and also trains people, helps people become better communicators. And when I say communicator, I mean speaking and writing. These things are the same thing. It's not, we don't, I don't separate out being a good public speaker with a good, good writer. If you're a good writer, you're a good public speaker. Um, mm -hmm. But more on that later. <laughs> that's about that it from me. That's super, and thank you very much indeed. And again, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And again, thank you for all the listeners to, to joining. So listen, a, a note to the audience, uh, this webinar is gonna be recorded um, and it would be excellent if uh, anyone who wants to submit any questions, uh, you have the opportunity to do so. Uh, please, uh, if you could, enter into the chat in the GoToWebinar side panel. Um, we're going to be stopping the session at around 1.40, and at which point we'd encourage you all to take part in the digital hangout taking place at ditto.tv slash mtd. Now, just briefly to explain the format, uh, I'm going to give just a couple of words on the book, which uh, Charlie was just referring to a moment ago. We're then going to delve straight into the story around the book's evolution and some of the points and some of the topics which Charlie covers therein. And then, as I mentioned, we'd love to have some participation from your side. So please do shoot questions across anything that comes to mind, any queries, any advice that you may be seeking. We'd love to explore that. So it's less of a dialogue directly between Charlie and myself and more of a conversation which involves yourselves as well. So today, as we've discussed, we're discussing the art of plain speaking, how to write and speak in a way that will impress the people that matter. And as Charlie mentioned, this won the best short book category at the Business Book Awards in 2019. 
This is a no-nonsense guide for anyone who wants to connect better with people in a workplace by speaking clearly and with purpose. The book is laid out, as you would expect, in very clear chapters covering very practical areas, such as how to come up with good ideas, how to speak well in public, how to best use social media. And one of my favorite chapters, and something I know that people who've worked with me in the past could wish I'd read many years ago, words to avoid if you want to speak or write with clarity. So let's dig straight into things with the author. Now, Charlie, you mentioned a few minutes ago some of the things that I think were the driving force in how this book evolved, but would you describe this as a, a call to arms or is it a more practical user guide? How, how is it that really this book came to be? Well, it's both. It's definitely both. And you know, funny you just mentioned my my sort of words to avoid. That's how it all started. I started doing a blog. I got I grew a bit fed up with seeing all these words used again and again and again and again, and they become meaningless. So I I started writing this sort of uh, irreverent blog, and everyone started. I got a huge amount of feedback, and uh, so I thought, you know what? There's a book in this. Um, so I I kind of well, you can't really just write. A, a book that's a sort of, as you say, is an anti-thesaurus. So I thought, well, actually, what would be really useful, what I wish someone had done for me maybe 20 years ago, was, you know, have a practical guide, something that people can buy and keep by their desk that is, is useful every day. You know, every one of us has got at some point to write an email to the boss or to a client or to stand up and make a presentation, you know, all these kinds of things. And you need to come up with ideas or you might be put in charge of a social media channel. You know, these are all I wanted to be practical. So, yes, it is a call to arms without a shadow of a doubt. This mm. way of speaking must stop. Mm. Um, and funny enough, when I started writing it, I remember people giving me advice saying, oh, no, I don't write it in that way. Oh, that's a bit irreverent. No, they won't like that in the corporate world. And I thought, well. I sort of, there was a little piece of me that said, well, oh, maybe I should write like that. And I remember waking up one morning and said, absolutely not. Which is when I wrote, wrote the first few words, which is, you know, this book is about common sense or something like that. Mm. <laughs> and carried on from there. <laughs> and so linked to that, then, why is it, do you think, that simple language can have such an impact? And, and why do people not prioritise this more in their communications? Well, I think that I might turn that around a bit and say it's more that it's the damage done by not using simple language, by, by, by making things overly complex um, when they needn't be. You know, I remember one client saying, you know, we're absolute experts at making the simple complex. And, and people kind of think that, well, it makes you sound a bit more clever or, you know, if you're esoteric, that makes it sound sort of more intelligent or, or more sophisticated. And of course, the opposite is true, especially if your audience immediately switch off. Um, mm. you, the real skill, of course, is is um, in you know. As back to your question, you know, why why does simple language have an impact? Well, because it does have an impact because people will listen to you because you will get your message across in a way that is clear, concise, and simple with impact. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And you talk a lot through the book about humanity and treating people with respect. You, you, you feel that clarity in communication directly correlates with these areas, I guess, and, and that perhaps a lack of clear communications conversely means you're effectively disrespecting people, consciously or otherwise. Is, is that a fair comment? A hundred percent. I mean, good, good, clear language is good manners because you are obsessed about your audience. So either you want, you know, you care about your audience, so you want to get a simple message across to them and you will do, well, you want to get a message across and you'll do that simply. Um, and so when, to, when good communicators think of individuals, so the best journalists, the best writers, the best radio presenters, TV presenters, they don't speak, so I hate this word, stakeholders. You know, everyone talks about stakeholders endlessly. And when you write for stakeholders, you know, everyone's a stakeholder in the universe these days. It used to mean someone who held a stake in the business. And so, you, you write from homogenous mass, uh, homogenous mass, and that is, that is impersonal. What you need to do is think of your average reader or think obsessively about who you are writing to and build a vivid picture of that person in your mind. That will keep your writing relevant, but it will also keep it human. Let me give you, I mean, one example I always use about this corporate way of speaking is this whole human resources. You know, you used to have personnel departments, at least that had the word person in it. Um, mm. We are just resources. You know, human resources puts us on the same level as coal. And if you if you take this language even further, it is much easier to restructure a human resource out of its role than to fire Bob, who's worked for you for 25 years. You're dehumanizing by using this language. 
And if you if you care about your employees, you know, if you're the CEO of a business or you're running a team, don't get another department to write emails if you have an, a message for them. These kind of bureaucratized, systemic, um, systemized emails that come out, you know, is, you know, CEO, get on the floor. You know, I'd rather have a CEO or a boss on the floor talking to me personally, even if they're shouting at me uh, or being rude, because that is a, a human relationship. It's not just we're going to get the machine to send an email. Um, and I think this people say, well, what about big businesses? It's the same in big business. People should be seen and human eye contact, all of those the body language, all of those, all part of it, I would say. Mm. Mm. No, I, I, I take I take the point that you're making there in terms of uh, the, the 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 lack of human interaction causing uh, causing issues in terms of uh, the depersonalization uh, effect which you're, I think you're drawing on there. Uh, mm. Another theme, another theme, Charlie, which uh, certainly came up in, in in the review that I had of the book is is the the notion of jargon uh, and the the importance of avoiding jargon and i think this can be raised on a number of different levels certainly you note in the book uh, the importance of trying to avoid jargon in written communications but one of the things that occurred to me is where where does the line i suppose get drawn between whether it be industry or sector related uh, uh, vernacular and and then jargon uh, and I, the reason i raise this is I think it's something that's it's interesting. I know when I was back in my banking days, we we had jokes about the use of TLAs, i.e., three-letter acronyms. Yes. Um, is exactly. this the sort of thing you're referring to, or or is it something a little a little different to that? Well, there's two. Yes, yeah, so there's you are absolutely right. There's two two types of speaking I'm talking about now. The, the first side is that kind of management speak buzzwords um or you know that kind of marketing speak. You know, we're innovative um, solutions innovative solutions that are sustainable, you know, overuse words like that. And then, of course, there is actual jargon, actual acronyms, actual insider talk, particularly in finance. So those two, those two are, are two separate things. My point is you need to strip everything away. And I start with this. If you truly understand a concept or idea, no matter how complex, um, the ones who truly understand those ideas are the ones that can explain it in the most simple terms to their granny. So my point with that is if you don't truly really understand the concept, that is when you start using more and more jargon because you kind of hide behind it. And it's the same. I was a financial journalist. I didn't understand anything when I started. I actually now do a course for, for, for people in sales and marketing in finance and in journalism, which is, you know, how to, um, you know, how to, um, you know, introduction to financial markets, the big picture, because no one ever tells you. And then you come into this language, this morass of words mm -hmm. and acronyms. And it's a total nightmare. So what you need to strip everything away and say, um, how would I explain this complex derivative product, this bit mm. of fintech, as a mental exercise more than how would I explain this to my granny? And if you can get there, then you can explain it to anyone and they'll grasp what your your, your meaning immediately. In terms of practical advice on that, the 80-20 rule. If you're making a talk, um, think about your audience, number one. Will 80% of my audience understand what I'm going on about if I use this particular word? Mm. If the answer is yes, I would say, you know, fine, use it. That, that's where I would draw a sort of line. Because some, of course, you have to use jargon in some, in, uh, in some instances. And, and, and linked to that, and I'm, I'm just thinking as you're responding there, how much of, uh, how much of the, the overuse of jargon is due to laziness versus uh, a deliberate desire to exclude and to keep things exclusive? Well, that's it. I mean, you know, there's a bit of both. So if you're a lawyer or, or, or particularly in finance, there's a danger you, you want to make it exclusive because you want to charge a higher fee. If you make it complex and esoteric, then you can charge people more because your your job is as a translator for that. So, mm -hmm. so is it deliberate? Yes, I think partly. For me, I think when it comes to kind of marketing um, and, and the communications industry, I put it in inverted commas, um, it is, it's, it's a lot of this is lazy thinking because it is much easier um, to use platitudes and words that you see everywhere all around you than it is to sort of think hard about what makes your business different to its competitors, why you stand out from the pack, and then explain that really simply. It's, it's, it's hard to do that. I would sit with clients for hours on end with meetings called, who are we? You know, mm. And it's tough to distill the cleverest, you know, the best writers can take a huge amount of information and get it across in a, in, in a very small amount of words, like a great painter can, can mm. in a few brush strokes, capture the essence. So it's not easy. So mm. yes, 
it's a lazy thinking. It's a, I'll just say we're an innovative, sustainable business delivering global solutions that empower our clients. You know, it's much easier to say, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. You haven't said anything about your business. What do you actually do? Well, I empower my clients to leverage opportunities in the retail space. What does that mean? Are you a shop? So just say what you are, you know, but why, why do we use this language? It's become so ingrained. It's like Japanese knotweed. Um, <laughs> Sorry, carry on. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm smiling because I suspect there may be others who are listening who are probably starting to feel a slight sort of a, a glare of heat on, on, on themselves as they think back perhaps to their own businesses and the application of some of these uh, these these adjectives themselves. So it's, uh, it, it is perhaps more pervasive than we even realise, this, uh, this, this slightly bland but um, often repeated, uh, you know, similar use of similar phraseology. It's, um, it's, it's, it's quite, quite stark when you actually step back and actually take a view. Um, well, I mean, I th we, we, yeah, sorry, Carol, Carol. No, no, please, Carol, please. Well, I was going to say, you know, what, what I don't understand, and of course, we're all prone to this kind of way of speaking. I mean, we, I, me, I mean, we, we, you fall into it. You know, what I don't understand is why when we're at home and we speak, you know, we don't speak to our friends and family those, like this. You know, why do we, we, we don the nonsensical corporate waffle hat as soon as we walk into those slide doors in the office or the Zoom meeting or whatever it is? You know, if our child or a child asked us to fix their bike, we wouldn't say to that child, well, I will offer you an innovative bike based solution that mm. will fulfill your needs in, in, in the cycling space and enhance your pedaling experience. You, you don't <laughs> say that. You say, I'll fix your bike. When yeah. you're in business, it's much easier to say, I will solve that particular. You, this is your problem. This yeah. is how I will solve it. Yes, yes. No, I, as I said, it's, it's, it's powerful when, when stripped back in such a way. And so it may, maybe sort of linked to that, um, but at a slight sort of tangent, perhaps, you know, what's your view then on language as, as a part of being a part of corporate culture? Because, you know, phrases, terminology, tone, um, these obviously have huge, huge impact and, and can be, I suspect, then used as a very positive or perhaps even a negative force. And you've kind of described both sides um you note that you know in the book businesses need to develop a house style yet uh, a lot of the book is also discussing the uh, as a rallying cry against the creation of too exclusive a means of communication how as business leaders can perhaps some of the participants listening you know approach these areas and, and navigate through that because it, it's clearly complex it's complex but it's also um I would argue quite simple and I think it again it's about stripping back and it's using simple language so when I say house style what I mean by that is if you work in the newspaper industry every newspaper will have a um a style guide and that all that is is it, anything from of course firstly the, the kind of tone of voice that you're using but also to um you know, the way you spell certain words and how where do you use a hyphen or do you use a hyphen with eurozone or you is it capitalized is it all one word you know when you write if you write as a business, all your writing must look the same, it must look, which makes it look therefore professional. If you read The Economist, mm. what is amazing about The Economist, um, whether or not you agree with what it's saying, is how beautifully it's written. So you can read every story in The Economist, which is written by probably 40 different writers, and it is the same tone of voice, because there is a sub-editor in there, or several, that make it sound at the same tone of voice. It is a co conversational but grown-up tone of voice. So when, whenever... Um, and there won't be a word of jargon in there, and it's engaging and beautifully written, which is why you read it. Um, mm. So whenever a business asks me, oh, tone of voice, you know, people overcomplicate this say, right, we're going to divide our, you know, and we will think about the audience, and then we're going to divide them into so many different segments mm. and try and speak in a different way to each segment. That, no, 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 no. Your all communications, Everything you do, imagine you are explaining something to an intelligent friend or even to your granny, same thing, okay? So what you do is you take that idea and you explain it simply. The star guide is about keeping you within certain parameters. For example, most star guides in newspapers may, are made up of words to avoid. <laughs> um, yeah. Don't just say you're innovative all the time because name a company that does not describe itself as innovative. There are none everybody's innovative and if everybody's innovative nobody's innovative what are you why are you original but back to that star so yes it is simple i might i try to make this simple which is go get the economist star guide you can buy it or mm. and then stick to that style 
and everything from the way they spell stuff or you know you can buy that star guide and if you've got a question in your mind about something open it up and it'll be in there and it'll explain a way to put it and if you can get that kind of tone of voice then everybody will understand what you're what you're talking about and you're mm. right there is a fine line because you don't want to patronize you don't want to be hey guys you know that's just patronizing and people are going to switch off but then you don't want to be too esoteric and so you need to fire that arrow down the middle which is explain it to an intelligent friend who's not necessarily part of your business but but then perhaps to be a little bit controversial and provocative yeah. uh, if everyone takes this you know very very simplistic uh somewhat uh um uh economist like and i'm just using that to continue this sort of the um the uh, mm. example you used then where where does distinction get drawn from if everyone has the same slightly sort of lacking in nuance type approach I suppose that's that's one of the things or is that where the subtlety starts to come in and that's where actually the real work takes place you strip back so the, to the yeah. core and then you begin to that, nuance without overdoing it so once you've stripped away it's like paint it's like a wall isn't it you know it's covered in old paint and wallpaper once you strip that all away you then have this blank wall so then you are able to say, okay, I'm going to put all that, all that sort of corporate ease, all that jargon, everything, I'm going to put that over there, right, mentally, I put that in that box over there. And the best writers and the best speakers, um, I say these star guides are like um, scaffolding around a building, okay, they're just an infrastructure, okay, it's yeah. not telling you how to write. So the best writers, um, and this is really hard for people, and, and I understand that completely, and, and it's about being confident, but they write as they speak. Which is why I yeah. said at the very beginning, good writers are good speakers and good speakers are good writers. Because if you write as you speak, then you get that conversational tone, those natural human cadences, that, mm. um, that aid understanding. And it goes back to you are always, no matter what you're doing, you're, you're always telling a story. You know, ever since Neolithic man sat around fires, Neolithic communities, I should say, sat around fires, they told each other stories. It is innate in our DNA. Uh, in our genetics as a species to receive stories. We, we receive stories. If you hammer a load of statistics and jargon at people, their brain, evolution switches off their brain, if anything else. You need to explain something in a way that is engaging and interesting. People just sort of think, well, because I'm saying it or, or putting this message out there, they, um, people will naturally listen. Mm. They will. You've got to make them listen. Mm. Right, yeah. Eric. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And so we've talked about a few different areas in terms of uh, the importance of simplicity, the importance of getting language right, the importance of treating people with respect through that application of the right type of tone and approach and lacking, or if you like, de-jargonizing de the approach to language. So as you're working through the market, as you're advising based upon your observations and the better practices out there, uh, a two-pronged two question, I suppose, really. First of all, we've talked about some of the mistakes, but firstly, I'd, I'd be interested in some of the biggest mistakes you've seen and, and tried to help you know, rectify, but also, more importantly, who's getting it right at the moment? And who are, who are the people that you put up there? You mentioned The Economist as one, but who are the companies uh, that you've had engagements with where you've, you've seen things that would evidence as, as really good good examples of clarity and, and in their communications and marketing? Well, uh, the example I always use, and the one I, I use, Brown, because I, I mean, I could go through a long list, and then some, some companies are better than others. I would say that I, there aren't too many yet who, I mean, in a way, I think it's getting worse. Um, but um, with a lot of companies, what the, the one example I always use, and it's an old example, but it's an important example, um, and it helps to clarify, is Apple, of course, as a business, they're now getting worse at it. It's what Steve Jobs did to Apple. So where after his hiatus, you know, Apple had drifted away from its original founding principles, and Jobs came back and he said, well, what am I, we don't have any clear messages here so he said in his opening speech um you know what do we want the world to know about us as a company and let's put that in a, in, in sort of three messages um mm. and everything was based around two words grammatically incorrect doesn't matter two words think different and every single apple product um everything and this is this is the best marketing you can ever do um you know, reflected in some way those that value of thinking different 
and it took it took that product and you know it took it from being a, a very useful computer with some nice gadgets that looked pretty to something above that it sort of became a lifestyle choice you know, buying an apple said something about you whether or not you found it particularly easy to use it was you know it, it's the best example because it it it, it um you know it rose above every other company you know, people were, they are ridiculously loyal to apple sort of perfectly normal rational people if you criticize their apple computer they're very upset um <laughs> And that's what they did. And The Economist is the same. Another brand that did that. You know, people bought The Economist not to read it, but to be seen carrying it about. And yeah. so um, it says a message or a Mercedes in the 70s. You know, no self-respecting dictator would, would not have a Mercedes in the 70s. It said <laughs> something about you. Um, and, and those kind of brands that they have very clear messaging, very clear marketing, usually based on one or two words or Audi, Borsprung, Dork, Technik. They don't even speak German. We all know what that means. So when you and but this works for every business. You might say, well, I'm a software company. Well, fine. Think what are the three things that make you stand out as a software company? I'll tell you what we are. We we you know we always answer our calls within three rings. Our our, our staff are always impeccably polite, and mm. um and we always get the job done. Whatever those three things are, people remember mm. you. They say, oh no, that software. They're they're the ones with the really polite people. They're just ridiculously polite, you know, or there's mm. something that makes you stand out and something very simple message mm. um, rather than all this kind of try the mistakes. What are the mistakes to make? You try and get all the information across at once. And that's why I gave back to this. Kind of, what happens is the marketing department says, what are we going to say about ourselves? What are the world going to know about us? And it goes to stakeholders in the business and everyone chips in. And that's when you end up with this porridge of committed to delivering in a bit. We're, in a bit, we're definitely in a bit. Get that in. Oh, we're sustainable because yeah. we care about it. Yeah, get sustainable in. And we're global. Yeah, yeah, get global in. We, we yeah. don't have products. We have solutions. Yeah, get that in. Yeah, and then suddenly you've got a morass. And no, and everyone's, by the way, stopped listening when you, when you said we're committed to delivering. <laughs> the brain just switches off. And you might think it's very important, but actually human nature dictates that when you hear these words again and again and again and again, it's like water over a worn pebble. The brain yeah. cannot process them, won't process them. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sit, I'm sitting here with, uh, with, with a sort of a cold shiver going down my back from... Uh, from <laughs> I didn't want to do that. <laughs> from, from meetings past and from, uh, from, you know, from things that I've been engaged in with myself. And I'm, I'm sure others on the call are probably having similar experiences. But speaking of people on the call, please do uh, drop any questions that you, you'd like to ask Charlie into the, uh, the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and I'll be happy to, to pick up on anything that you'd like me to raise, any questions, observations even. Uh, if you agree, if you either don't agree, um, again, please feel free to to engage, and I'll look to try to get across anything that I can to to Charlie. Uh, I'm certainly enjoying some of his observations and some of the comments. It's um, it's fascinating when you do have the chance just to take a bit of a step back, um, what you can see through through another person's eyes. Um, and perhaps maybe just sort of changing tack a little bit. Um, you, you've talked about. Uh, a, a range of different things, practic practical pieces, micro, macro. Um, one of the chapters in the book looks very much at the, the one of the things that puts fear into the heart of many, which is public speaking. And, and I know that mm. I was I was always told to over prepare and then go with the flow. But at a more practical level, you've studied this and you've seen different people and you offer some thoughts in the book. What what would be some of the key advice that you you extol when you're engaging with people now on this subject? Okay, so what for all public speaking, it's um, first of all tackle your nerves. Now, if you what I say about nerves is that you know, I still get incredibly nervous. Um, once you have no nerves, you don't care anymore. If you're the worst public speakers are the ones who don't get nervous because they stand up there all day. So and, and talk all day. So the first thing is structure is king. The best. How do you defeat these nerves? Well, you have a impeccable structure so you and you never make more than about five points during any talk because the brain won't um the brain won't uh take in more than about five points so if you if this is a presentation if this is a sales pitch it's really important to remember or even a speech at a wedding make five uh three to five points keep to your allotted time limit never overrun i'm now going to make more than five points by the way um brevity <laughs> is the soul of wit you know, uh, they reckon research has shown with public speaking that 18 minutes is the absolute maximum of, of an individual standing on the stage that um, the brain can sort of handle. So, mm. you know, always, always think about that. So I think so. Um, 
again, back to um, the best speeches, of course, are, are, are stories. It doesn't matter if it's a pitch or anything like that. So, so they have a beginning that grabs people, a middle that entertains it, and an end that leaves it wanting more. Um, mm. When you are standing up speaking publicly, um, you know, it's about the hardest thing about public speaking, and what I do when I help people, uh, you know, get better is it's about building up the confidence to be yourself on stage. So what we tend to do is we write our speech out, and then we read because we're nervous. And I've done this, and we all do this. We we just read it out, and fine, it can be a good speech, but we we stick to the script. And often we've written it in that sort of weird. I'm delighted to be here today at the commencement of the, you know, this kind of language which is inhuman and so of course no one's really listening and it's very mm. obvious when you're reading from a script. If you can get, the, and the hardest thing about it uh, is having the confidence to be yourself on stage. You know, the best speakers, you'll know them, you'll see them, um, is they stand on stage without any notes and they wave their arms about, and it's those TED Talks, and they are, um, they're relaxed and informal and engaging and the reason they're that is because they're, they're human and they're engaging with us on a human level and in a conversational way and it feels like you're part part of it and not separate from it so mm -hmm. how do you get this confidence well as i say structure is king get that structure and then as you just said you know practice 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 um mm -hmm. is is um is one way the other of course and what everyone should do and shouldn't be ashamed to do is go onto YouTube, look up look up your favourite speakers and it, it might be someone like Dimbleby or it might be Martin Luther King or JFK or Winston Churchill or whoever, who, who, whoever you're, you know, watch them speak, see what they do, see how they structure their speeches and then you'll see at the end, actually it's all quite a basic structure that everyone uses for each speech. Mm. Things like, you know, the power of three, omni trium perfectum, which is Latin for you know the, um, um, everything in three in threes is perfect. You know, vini, vidi, vici, or liberty, egality, egality, fraternity. You know, um, all of these. If you say things in groups of three, it's memorable. You know, there are little sort of tricks like that um, yeah. that can be used. But I'd say that absolute one thing to take away is um, that brevity is the soul of wit, and less is more limit your information to three to five points and stick to that um, structure or um, as Franklin D. Roosevelt said on public speaking, be, see be sincere, be brief, be seated. Uh, I think that's probably <laughs> the best advice you can probably get. I, I think that's, uh, that's absolutely on the money, uh, I think is the term. That's fantastic, actually. I, I, and it's a really good practical advice there as well in terms of sort of general general counsel for uh, for people who are preparing or who are having to do a little bit more of this and um, you know there's, there's various various ways to, to get the job done but you do need to have a few uh, a few guidelines and a few things to be thinking about as uh, as you engage more and as you try to get better at doing this so that, I think some really helpful tips there Charlie thank you for that oh no um, I'm sorry actually I just remembered one more just to annoy you sorry I've just seen this quote from Churchill which I only saw the other day which is you can't go anywhere without a quote from Churchill. The art of public speaking consists of selecting three or four absolutely sound arguments and then putting these in the most conversational matter possible. There you go. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's an, another another excellent one. And I wish I could remember it verbatim, but there was another super one from Churchill about if you want to, if you want him to speak for fifteen minutes, he needs a day, and if you need him to speak for an hour, he needs an hour. He needs a longer period of time. I can't remember, but something about that yeah. brevity language i'll have to get myself organized to, to quote that more effectively um, well there was so yeah one about being you know my spontaneity or whatever it takes weeks of uh, practice or something. exactly yeah. yes the, yeah, you know the one i mean um look at with, with the time sort of coming up we've got about five minutes left there's another another area i just wanted to just wanted to explore and the, the time's absolutely flown away but um and i thought it was really really well observed and i think for people listening they may they may also have the uh, ability to uh, to find some common ground on this but you you noted a number of characters in your time working through the corporate world and i think in some both the Using but very well described titles such as senior prefect, the turbo thruster, the pussing boots. Um, could you give the audience perhaps a bit of a sense of some of these? And, and I'm sure there'll be some nodding heads and you know just how you, how you came about and, and what you observed some of these different people that you you saw in and around the office environment. Oh uh, yes, of course. Yeah, no. Well, I just kind of I wanted to. I was trying to sort of think of a way of helping people, you know, navigate this office environment. Say there are certain office personalities, and I suppose I'd been working with twenty years, both 
as a journalist, but also inside cor corporates. And they sort of these, they, I suppose it was just about kind of, um, yeah, uh, differentiating these different and how to treat them. So, as I say, you know, I think you mentioned the turbo thruster. That's the kind of hardworking, ambitious, usually head of sales, not scheming. I compare them to sort of Labrador that rushes over and tries to lick your face. But I mean, there's, they, they tend to be, you know, that, that's one of them, you know, and they, they can also, they might tell the odd, you know, dodgy joke or get overexcited or, you know, um, then you've got diligent squirrels and every every office has a diligent squirrel. They, they work incredibly hard, conscientious, quiet people, um, never complained, but as they don't be fooled by the appearances, you know, they, they, um, they're very ambitious and, and, and will always pull a late one and, and, um, uh, you know, they, they, as I, what I say, yeah, they crack nuts if they need to. Um, but the diligent, diligent squirrel, they, they were in there, the hot air balloon, you know, the, everyone knows a hot air balloon. They go around puffing themselves up, saying how wonderful they are, but actually, you know, really, you know, it's, it, they might be colourful and float around the office looking nice, making a lot of not roaring, but uh, really there's just hot air inside of them. Um, and uh, it was a bit of fun doing this, but yes. um, and just other characters to, to to watch out for as you you know as you go through as you go through the office really and your and your life and you kind of sort of where do I fit in? You know, we're obviously all a little bit of all of them, some of us. So sure. it's just it's a good way to sort of reference where you fit in, I suppose. But anyway, it was a no, bit. Of I, I completely agree, and I, I think again, it's it's a, it's a, it, it evidences as well, you know, the the. The, the, the way that the book is structured with a lot of very sound, very, you know, very well observed practical advice, with also a nice dose of humor at times as well, which, uh, which again, I think is a very nice contrast and adds, uh, adds another layer to, to the read. So very insightful and, and great fun as well. Um, look, final question before um, I ask for maybe a closing thought from, from your side, Charlie, if I could, which is, um, you, you know, we've talked about your chapter on public speaking, where you, you give guidance and advice on, on obviously what is a challenging subject. But uh, I, I wondered really if uh, in an updated version of your book, um, you would likely see a chapter on the ability to impact performance in a video conference environment. It, it seems certainly with recent events that the world's moved very much online and this medium is, is really going to be here to stay. It's also one I suspect that has mm. its own engagement is it uh, is it something where you're seeing either good or bad practices emerging from your participation across endless zoom or team meetings i think probably the only bad practice is that people forget that you know when you're online when you're in a zoom meeting um you've actually got to be um you know all the same rules apply but they're just more in focus so um it's actually even harder to engage people because you're not seeing them you're not with them you know so so you need to be twice as engaging you need to be you you need to make your speeches even shorter get to the point more quickly um mm. and and so that's definitely the first um uh first point and i'd also say never have more it's like conference calls never have more than 10 people on a zoom conversation you can't you just it's not going to work people talking over themselves people switch off you know they put their face up that freezes and then they go and make a cup of tea um so it's just say it, it's twice as difficult to engage people people's attention spans online are shorter you know the natural instinct for the brain at any time in any conference is to or any zoom or any speech is to think what am i going to have for dinner tonight where am i going on holiday you've got to arrest that train before we're doing it now arrest that train of thought and get to the point really really quickly so again structure have that structure make go into that meeting saying i'm going to make five three points <laughs> these are the three points i'm going to make and that's all and i'm going to make them really clearly and then i'm going to make them again and again and again the same three points so that when people walk out of that zoom meeting it those three points are uh in in their head um and so yeah that's what i would say it's the same rules but more more sharply in focus should we say Yes, no, that's uh, that's excellent, and I think again, uh, very well well summarised. So, look, uh, we're we're pretty rapidly reaching uh, the, the end of our our call and our discussion. And uh, as I say, I've really really enjoyed the uh, the thoughts and the input. So, my sincere thanks, Charlie, for you for your uh, your 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 taking us through uh, the benefit of your your experience and sharing with us the uh, the input and the output from from your book which again the art of plain speaking how to write and speak in a way that will increase the impress the people that matter um, maybe just as a, a way of rounding off um, do you have a, maybe one closing comment or thought that you'd like the audience to take away from today that uh, that will help them in their journeys Charlie Okay, uh, one thought is this, and thank you, Andy. It's been great fun talking to you. Um, uh, five points. There you go. Five points. Okay, if you're going to take anything away, 
if you anytime you write a speech or write an email or write a presentation or whatever, it, I would say bear these five points in, in mind. One, know your audience. Think obsessively about your audience. That will keep your writing relevant. Imagine an individual, not a group of people. You'll write for an individual. Um, two, be clear. Clarity is king. Reread every sentence you write and say, have I said this in a clear way? Have I got my message across in the simplest way possible? Number three, be concise. OK, concision, all the best writing is concise. Hemingway, the great author, used to say, learn to say no to your typewriter. Uh, the best writers can get the most amount of information across using the least amount of or the fewest amount of words. So always try to be concise and don't waffle. Four, use simple language, Sh full stops of free, short words, short sentences. Don't let the writing get in, way, get in the way of the message. Think obsessively about the message that you want to get across and don't let your writing get in the way. Finally, if you are doing marketing um, or, or, or social media, say something interesting. People don't want to listen, but if you say something interesting, they do. Whenever you write anything, ask yourself the question, does this pass the so what test? If I read this, would I tell a friend? Is it interesting? Have I engaged an emotional response from someone? Laughter, intrigue, anger, doesn't matter. Say something interesting. So there you go. Those are my five rules. Quickly well, put. Well, very well put. And, and, and I would expect nothing less from someone who's put together the book <laughs> on the art of plain speaking. So in that respect, thank you again for that. And uh, to find out more about uh, this and to find out more about Ditto and the services being provided, please visit ditto.tv. I've mentioned this session has been recorded and a link to that video will be shared via email. Uh, please visit ditto.tv slash MTD straight after this webinar ends for a digital hangout with Charlie and myself. For more information and for a copy of today's slides or to discuss any of the topics covered, please get in touch with Ditto on control at ditto.tv. On screen now, you will see the other events we have happening throughout the day. So until then, just to say a very warm uh, thanks to Charlie and my thanks to you all to attending. Uh, it's been great fun and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye for now. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone.